السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا ومن كفر فإن الله غني عن العالمين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من حج فلم يرفث ولم يفسق رجع كيوم ولدته أمه أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Today, inshallah, we'll be talking about one of the most important journeys in our lives to fulfill one of the fara'id of Islam, which is Hajj. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have said, Buni al-Islam ala khamsin. Islam is founded on five pillars. Shahada, salah, zakah, fasting of the month of Ramadan, and hajj. So hajj is one of the pillars of Islam. And since this ibadah is normally performed only once in a lifetime or occasionally, therefore, a lot of time people don't know the method of doing it, and especially for us it's done away from home, so there are a lot of things that we need to know about this journey to make sure that we don't have to go through hardships of traveling over there and we can concentrate on our ibadah. Of course, as we know that if we talk about salah, there are so many things that we need to cover in related to Salah that of course will need a long time and Hajj is a complete journey. So it needs much more time to cover everything about it. Here I would be just mentioning some important points about Hajj and the method of performing Hajj. That would insha'Allah be enough to make the journey as simple as possible, as comfortable as possible, and we would be able to take benefit and advantage of this ibadah and understand that our journey mainly is for a ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not like a normal journey where. I'm going to enjoy, so I'm looking for this and that, and I'm looking for the highest level of service. Mainly is the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the things that we really notice over there, that a lot of time, people that come, that go from this part of the world, they really lose their ibadah. I see this a lot. People that go from this part of the world, you see them losing the ibadah totally. And the purpose, is, the reason is, that one of the most expensive packages of hajj that you can find maybe from this part of the world. With the least time, and the highest amount of money that you will spend. 
So, now when a person who have spent 8,000, 9,000, and some packages, 12,000, 13,000. So of course the person expects service according to the money he has spent. Now when he goes over there and he says that he sees that he's being treated like anyone else in that area, and he asks the person sitting next to him, how much did you guys get your package for? I got it for 3,000, but I spent 11,000. And we are sitting on the same seat. In fact, he may be sitting on the seat and you are standing up. Right there you start boiling. That there is, they spend not even one third of what I spend. And here they are getting better service than I do. And on top of that, you know what will happen? That person will tell you all the good things about Hajj. And you are thinking about all the bad things on it. Because you spend too much money. So you are thinking that I didn't get the best hotel. You know, I was expecting to get a better hotel service, but I never got that. And I was expecting that the person that sold us this package be with us. And whenever I need him, he is there to serve me. And I don't even, I never seen that person until now. And I don't expect to see him until I get back home. And this happens a lot. Amazing things happen during this journey. Remember, people who are selling these packages, this is their business. Me and you, we take it as, we are going to Baytullah. We are going to Hajj. This is Farida. And that person, it's a business for him. Reality is a reality. They are doing their, making their living through this business. So they are not doing a favor to people. They are not doing sadaqat or anything like this you are dealing as a business with those people now when you go over there you would have to decide should i run after the money that i spend and try to get what he promised me or should i just concentrate on my ibadah and forget of what i have spent if you try to run after your money the money is gone and the ibadah is gone too this is a fact so therefore, whatever money you have spent, you have spent it already. At least get the ibadah and come back successfully with getting the ibadah done properly. Another thing that we find in these expensive packages, that they try to, because the package is expensive, so they try to make things very simple and easy for people who have joined the package. In that situation, Sometimes, even the haram becomes halal. Things that are not allowed, you will get the fatwa of, of it being allowed. Why? Because if I tell him no, then he would be upset. And he paid me $10,000 for the package. Can I tell him no now? So therefore, really, you, the reason I'm mentioning it, because anyone who would hear these talks, they have to understand when you are asking masail and rulings of sharia to the person, you should know who you are asking and understand that what would be his answer in relation to your connection with him, that if you spend and he's the one who's selling you the package or anything like this, then maybe ask someone else in some other group. Unfortunately, many times, people are paid, scholars, imams, are paid to join the group. So that imam or scholar has also been considerate of how he is going to be issuing the fatwa, because this is his last trip with this group, and next time he has to find another group, or he wants to keep the group happy also, so he has to say things according to the need of the time. And this happens a lot too. Amazing, amazing things I have seen. Remember one of the things that the rules of Hajj, the method and the rules of Hajj, these are one of the very difficult issues of Sharia. Salah, of course, is easy, but sometimes when you go into the detailed rulings of Salah, it may become a little difficult. If someone will ask us, here a person comes and he says, you know, I was in Sajda, and I didn't remember. And I started reciting Tashahud in Sajda. At-Tahiyyat lillahi wa salawat wa tayyibat. I realized I was in sajda. So right away I got up. Now he's asking you, is my salah valid or not? 
And I'm sure most of us now would be confused what should we say about that situation. Is his salah valid or his salah is not valid? Because he didn't decide subhanahu rabbi al-ala. He didn't decide any of the tasbihat. He, he was doing tahiyyat in his, his sajda. So same thing with hajj. And in hajj, people tend to make more mistakes. Number one, because they haven't done hajj. Maybe this is the first in their lifetime or haven't done it for a long time. And number two, because it's a long process, so people even forget and they end up doing things in a totally opposite or wrong way than it's supposed to be done. So a lot of these issues, they keep on coming up every year in Hajj. I experience new rulings, new things, new mistakes from people and they are such confusing that sometimes people have given this person all kind of different rulings and fatwas that in reality are not correct and this person feels that now I have to offer a sacrifice I have to come back next year I don't know what else he has to do they really I mean the person is in total confusion so we have to be very careful about how we perform the Hajj. And as I said, very important thing to remember, for us is not a business trip. We are not going for enjoyment or for any other purpose. It's ibadah, especially. It's one of the very important ibadahs of Islam. So we would like to perform the ibadah in the best way possible. Before going into the ibadah itself and the method of performing the ibadah, since we will be going and experiencing a long journey from here all the way to Mecca and Medina. So I just want to mention some important things that we need to keep in mind for the journey. Although these, thing, these things may seem to be of the worldly things, but they will make the journey very easy inshallah, will help you in a lot of different stages of your journey so that you can inshallah concentrate on your ibadah rather than studying to worry about other things once we are over there. One thing, one is, thing that is very important before we leave, we should make copies of our all the important documents that we are taking with us. So if you're taking your passport and for sure your passport will be with you, so you need to keep a copy of your passport. Keep a copy of the traveler's check that you may be taking. And I will tell you more about money later on. Uh, the, if you have paper ticket, is not e-ticket, then keep a copy of the ticket also. Uh, keep it, uh, uh, there is a check in your passport uh, that is for the uh, Saudi government. Keep a copy of that check also. These are important documents that we are taking with us. And if there is any other document, that is of value and you are taking it with you, keep a copy of it and may even be easier if you keep an electronic copy nowadays so that if you need to pull it out, you can just get your email over there and pull it out right there on the, from the computer and print it. God forbid if the passport is lost or check is lost or anything else in that situation, at least you have access to the copies and prove that yes, I'm a citizen of this country, this is my passport number, this is what I am, who I am. So it's very important that will make your life very easy in case of that emergency to keep, have copies of these things. Number two, before leaving, before you get into the, before the day of your travel, tra uh, make sure you confirm or reconfirm your seat. Although your travel agent may have told you that I have confirmed the seat, don't worry about anything. I always suggest reconfirm it before your travel date because we know during the days of Hajj that is one of the highest season of traveling and especially with people of our names. So now Muhammad Abdullah is traveling and in their system there may be 100 Muhammad Abdullah. Now when you go over there they check you okay uh, we don't have any seat for you today your seat is after three days and right there you are in a situation where you are broken off from your group. People that you are traveling with, they are not with you anymore. So a lot of situations could come up. It's better always to reconfirm the seat. When you are reconfirming the seat, make sure you book your 
food also at the same time, whichever halal food you prefer. Because if you don't book it, the travel agent may not do it, depends on, depending on the airline, you get the food and you realize over there, you know, this is my hajj trip, I don't want to take a chance, I don't want to eat haram, and right there you have no food. So it's good to reconfirm the ticket and at the same time book the meal also. Keep some food for you for the journey. It's a long journey. Depends on the airline again. If there is a transit somewhere, then the journey may take you around 20, 24 hours before you arrive to the final destination and could even be longer because you may be just thinking about arriving at Jeddah. No, we will arrive at Jeddah after 20 hours, but from Jeddah to Makkah, you don't know how long it would take over there. So the journey altogether, maybe 24 hours, 28 hours, sometimes in some situations, 30 hours. So keep some food with you for the journey, dry food of course, nothing that uh, kind of spill uh, and uh, liquids, I'm sure everyone knows that are more dangerous than guns these days. So, which means they won't let you take it in the plane. Keep some extra pictures with you. Not your spouse's, your own. Keep some extra pictures with you. The back of the picture, it would be good to write your passport number on it. So at least you have a passport number with your picture. And if your passport has an old picture, of yours, then take a new picture, staple it at the end of the, the last page of the passport and keep it over there so that if any time someone opens the picture, you know what happens over there is, other than being on the border or the airports, over there they will sometime when they're looking for a passport, they will look at your picture, okay, but this is not you, okay, he's going to put it on. He has no time to read all the names. So, he will be looking at people by their face. That is the fastest way. And now your picture doesn't match you. You took the picture 20 years ago. Or it was the picture of the days of Jahiliyyah. Now you have a different type of picture. So, it happens a lot. Different type of picture that people come with. And, sister, having a totally different type of picture here, there is a big scarf. And the person never recognizes her with her scarf. That this, no, it can be you. So it's good to have the newest picture stapled at the end, at the last page of the passport, so that if a person will look at that picture, at least he will know, okay, this is you. As far as the money over there, don't think of taking cashier check, traveler's check, or any of those type of things because. For checking that, for cashing that, you will need a passport and you don't have your passport on you because the time you arrived at Jeddah, your passport was taken away and you would get your passport only once you get back to Jeddah. So throughout the journey, throughout your period in Saudi Arabia, you don't have your passport in you. The best thing is to keep cash and even in cash, keep $100 bills. That will give you the highest value of exchange rate and out of the hundred dollar bills, keep the newest one, crispy ones. I'm telling you, it makes a difference. So the newer bill will give you a better rate over there than the old bills. If your bills have writing on it, maybe you want to go to the bank, bank and exchange it because you lose the value of at least two, three riyals if there is writings on it other than what originally is printed on it. So these things do make a difference over there. Keep a pouch with you, with a belt. This is extremely important. You want to keep a good pouch with you, with a belt, so you can keep all the valuables in the pouch. When you are leaving from here and you are packing your handbag, keep some at least one pair of your dress clothing in your handbag. Sometimes people at the arrival over there, they don't get their bag. And if you don't have it, you need to change right after you take, after Umrah or as soon as you get over there, if you're going to Medina, you want to change and you don't have no clothing on you, with you. 
except the pair that you're wearing, and after 24 hours, for sure, you want to change it. So keep at least one pair and rest. Don't worry, you can buy a lot over there, but at least one pair, if a person would need it at any time, at least it's there. Things that you need over there. And this is why I kept these papers over there. If anyone wants to know, this is not the side, the written side is not for, uh, the purpose of it is not that side, it's the other side. So you can make your notes, things you want to take with you. Because we may forget later on. Things that we may need over there. Keep at least two small padlocks with you. Number two, you need a nail clipper but you can get it over there. Two locks is better to carry them from here. At least you have them with you. As soon as you arrive Jeddah, you get your bag over there, put the locks on it. Here, you are not allowed to lock your bag. Or you may lock it without really locking it, just keeping it in the zipper and locking it and saving the keys with you. But it cannot be locked from here because this is against the rule. They want you to keep it open so when they want to check it, otherwise they'll break your bag. So, don't lock it from here. You can put the lock in it or on it, but don't lock it. Another thing that people really need over there is fragrance-free soap. A soap, fragrance-free, because during Ihram, we are not allowed to use anything with fragrance. And you may find it over there, but last year our experience was that it was a little difficult to find it over there. Every year before that it was very easy. Only last year was difficult. So Allah alam, what will be the situation this year? But if you can find fragrance-free soap, get it and take, keep it with you. But don't spend extra money because it's amazing. You know, they make a soap and they charge you a certain amount of money. And then fragrance-free it will be even a higher price that you have to pay. They didn't have to even put a fragrance in it and it's still higher price. So just like food, you buy sugar free. So they save their sugar and you pay extra amount of money for buying sugar free. So over there, you get it very inexpensive. And if I use the word cheap, it won't be wrong for it. Comparing to what you pay over here. Anyway, if we get something reasonable, it's good to keep it. In case of emergency, keep some bandage with you also. That helps sometime by accident you kick something, you hit something, you get a cut, small cut or something. So it's good to have, good to have some bandages with us. For the journey, during the journey and over there, you would need tasbih. That is very important, keep a subha with you. So that that will always remind you, keep on using your time in the remembrance and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, that we forget and the person doesn't know what to do with his time and it's a long journey and we are sitting in the past, we don't know what to do. I want to read Quran, but I don't have wudu and all of these situations. Keep a subha with you, recite subhanallah, astaghfirullah, la ilaha illallah, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq. So make sure you keep a subha with you. And number two, of course, we should keep our Qur'an with us so we can recite as much Qur'an as possible during this journey. Number three, any book of dua that you prefer. Unfortunately, these days, people are not used to having books of du'as at home either. So if you tell a person book of dua, and really a lot of people won't even know what book of dua, what does that mean? We should all have some book of dua that we know that this is a book that has a lot of duas from the Prophet ﷺ. So every day a person decides some of these duas, he learns some of these duas. So anyway, keep a book of dua with you. In these days, you want to make sure that you take some, a jacket or a sweater with you because it's going to be cold over there. In Mina and Arafat, in Ihram, men won't be able to wear it, but women are still allowed to wear it. So they will wear it even in those days. And for us, we will need it in Medina. And sometime maybe we will need it in Mina and Arafat after the Ihram is off. In Mina and Arafat after the Ihram is off. Keep some type of shoes that you feel comfortable walking in them. Whichever shoes are good and comfortable for you to walk in, keep that because there will be a lot of walking over there. 
And for sisters, there is no restriction on what type of shoes they wear as long as they don't take sandals with high heels. Because that's not the place for it. But, which means something that you can walk in it very comfortably, that is very important because there will be a lot of walking over there. For men, only during the time of ihram, which is only a few days, we won't be able to wear it. But other than that, you would be able to wear those. So keep that uh, 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 with you. In fact, if you are not wearing ihram from here, you may wear them from here also and keep them on you. Now, oh, one more thing, medicine. If any person is on any type of medication, make sure you keep your prescription and medicine. And that medicine has to be labeled so you don't have a hard time over there at the airport. So, buy the prescription medicine, keep an extra prescription with you, take a prescription from your doctor and keep it with you. And at the same time, make sure the medicine, it's labeled, don't take it out of the packages to save room. And then you have loose tablets or anything like this and you have difficulty over there. With this, it's always good to keep some, something like a Tylenol and uh, I mean, these type of medicine that ibuprofen or Tylenol, whichever you prefer. And also one course of uh, antibiotics. Because generally people need that course of antibiotic over there. So it's good to keep it, keep one course of it with you. But don't take it without, of course, consulting a doctor over there. If it's needed, then you can use it. Very important for sisters. Don't take any jewelry with you. I'm sure people don't plan to take it. They plan to bring it from there. But still I have to remind that don't take any jewelry with you. During the days of Hajj, you don't want to wear any jewelry. Don't depend on your purse that I'm going to keep my valuable in my purse. Never. You can never save your valuables in your purse. Remember, these are the days when throughout the world, people's eyes are on that place. And I'm telling you, this is a fact. Everyone's eyes are just at that place in those days. All people, different people go over there for their, uh, for their own agenda. They have their agenda of going over there. Me and you may be going for Ibadah. But the three million people that are coming over there, not all of them, and I'm telling you, not all of them are there for Ibadah. There is a good number of people that would be there for different purposes. All the way from stealing and robbing people, up to trying to destroy your hajj. Everything is happening there. So, and every year, every year we hear, hear cases. Even after we say this, every year we hear cases where a sister carrying large sum of money in her purse and the purse was gone. She thought, no, I can hold it, I will be holding it. And before she even knew it, people who come over there, their experience. They came for that purpose. It's not a person from the street just came and went for high to steal over there. These are the people who were uh, trying, I mean, which means getting uh, lessons on it for the whole year or for years. And they come there every year for doing the same thing. So within seconds you lose your stuff and you won't even know it. Two years ago, I think, or three years ago, a sister who had her small purse tied inside of her socks, on her leg, inside of her socks. And when she went into sujood, that was gone. From inside the socks. So, this is only an example to let you know that you have to be careful. And don't take chances with these type of things. I said, then a person just starts worrying about these things over there. And no reason of putting ourselves in that situation. Now, of course, we want to talk about ihram and things you would need for ihram. So as we are preparing for ihram, for sisters, as I said, there isn't too many restrictions as much as there are for men. And if it was the other way around, you would have heard it everywhere, heard it everywhere in the news. 
But there are certain restrictions that are for everyone. Now, generally, preparing for ihram is that you want to make sure you take simple clothing for sisters, nothing attractive, nothing that will draw people's attention to it, in a way that is very modest, because it's ibadah. You don't want to ruin your ibadah and the ibadah of other people. Men, of course, will be wearing, during the days of haram, will be wearing only two sheets and a slipper. That's it. So, this is the haram for men, the two sheets and a slipper. If a person is going straight to Medina, then don't even worry about buying the haram from here. Buy everything in Medina Munawwara. And then you can take it with you to Mecca, uh, whatever you need from there. But if you need, if you're going straight to Mecca, then for sure you need at least one pair of ihram with you. So then you will keep a pair of ihram, slippers that you can use during ihram, and the belt, as I said, pouch with a belt, so that you can tie your ihram with it and at the same time keep your valuables in it. If you wear glasses, try to keep, and the reason I said try, you really should do it, but I take only one, this is why I said try. Try to take an extra pair with you. Now, it's time for the person to leave home. Before leaving home, try to fulfill all the rights of people as much as possible. If you have done wrong to people, ask them to forgive you. If you owe people anything, give it back to them or straighten that situation as much as you can. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and continuously keep on asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for anything that you have done in the past. You are going on a journey where we expect inshallah everyone comes back from the journey as Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Raja'aka yawmi waladatu ummu. Comes back, that's the way, the day he was born. Free of sins, totally, clean records, pure heart, iman, the heart is ready to accept iman. And the iman could get into the heart as it comes in the heart. It will just keep on getting into the heart because all the dirt, all the dust, all the rust, everything is gone. All the sins are washed away. The person is clean and pure and now he is just ready to start a fresh life now. When a person is leaving for this journey, at the, we should always think that I want to make this journey a journey of a lifetime that will bring a change in my life. A journey that will change my life. I don't want to come back in the same situation that I'm leaving, which means come back and be the same person that I was before. Now, when people would see me, they would see totally new person here with a new personality, a personality of Iman. People can see that mashallah, after Hajj, we see that this person, alhamdulillah, is more into the deen of Allah. This person have really changed. So we want to go with that intention to bring that change in our life, inshallah. Out of the things that we take, I forgot one more thing, that in Mina and Arafat, you would need a sleeping bag. Especially for those people who do not use futa, you know what futa, in Urdu they call it lungi, a sheet that we wrap it around yourself. You know the brothers from Yemen and Bangladesh, they use it as part of their dress. So they're used to it. For people like us, we are not used to wearing that. Now, ihram sheet is open from the side like it's not sewn all the way. So it's not round, it's a straight sheet, so you tie it around yourself. You are not used to using it, so when you go to sleep, it opens up. So therefore, in that situation, slipping bag is the best thing that you get in it. So now you don't have to worry about anything. But if you don't do that, and you just take a sheet on top of you, and the sheet moved or something, and under the sheet is... Muharramat there. As one of the scholars, he said, you know, during Hajj, when I wake up for Salat al Tahajjud, I close my eyes and walk. <laughs> he said, it's less, maybe less to step on people's feet than to keep my eyes open. So, this is why sleeping bag is one of the good choices, really, for having it over there. 
keep a small pillow with you that helps although in some of the packages you get a sleeping bag you, or not, not a sleeping bag you get a bedding over there and most of the travel agents that discourage people from taking a sleeping bag because it takes room everywhere in the bus in Mina, Arafat, all of those places. So they don't like people to take it. And I always fight with them and I always encourage people to take it. Because for us, as I said, we are not used to sleeping in that way with the haram. The handbag that you have would be good if you are used to carrying a backpack, then keep a backpack with you. That becomes very helpful. If not, at least you should have a stroller that with the tires, so you can pull it. You don't have to always carry it in your hand because it becomes difficult. There is a lot of walking over there and becomes difficult for some time to walk for long distances while carrying weight. So backpack becomes very handy. At that time, you can keep your staff and at the same time as a stroller that you can pull, that may also be very helpful. But just something that you carry, it's very difficult. This is for the carry on. So that carry on, you will keep it with you. Your bag bags will stay in Makkah. But when you go for five days, Mina, Arafah, Muzdalifah, back to Mina, during those days, you will be having a backpack or you have your carry on that you had with you, like uh, the stroller type of thing. You keep it with you. And you keep all the valuables or, or not valuables, all the things that you need, you keep them in that that you need during those five days, which means two pair of clothing. This is over there, not from here. So you will take, put, uh, when you're packing that for now ready to go for Hajj, you're packing your one bag that you will keep with you at all times. So that will have at least two pair of clothing, one extra pair of ihram, and your slippers or shoes that you will be wearing, and the uh, jacket, uh, because if you're in ihram for men, you are not wearing it at that time. So these extra things that you need uh, uh, in Mina and Arafat and Muzdalifah, you would keep them in that bag. Now, let's go into the journey itself and performing the ibadah. Leaving from here, make sure you recite all the du'as for leaving home. Before leaving home, perform two rak'ah salah, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all the sins, make the journey easy, and make, uh, accept this journey. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the ibadah of everyone that comes over there, one of the du'a, special du'a you want to make, that Ya Allah, I'm going through this journey. Don't make me an har- a harmful person to anyone during this journey. Make me a person that will always be providing the most comfort to others. You don't want to go over there and be a burden on others, which means on other hajjaj regardless who they are, from which part of the world they may have come. Make salam and du'a to your family. Make the du'as that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make. Astawdi Allah dinakum wa manatakum wa khawatima amalikum. Give them, which means you are giving them as a trust to Allah subhanahu wa taala that Ya Allah keep this trust until I come back. For the car, for the journey, at every step, try to remember all of these du'as. And the, there are books, small books of du'as that will have all of these du'as. Now, during the journey, make sure that you offer all the prayers on time. I see a lot of people missing fara'id while going for hajj. Hajj is still less farida than the salawat. Salah is the most important one. The person is going for hajj and missing the normal prayers. So, we have to be very regular, punctual on all of our fara'id and on the salawat. On the way, try to make use of the time as as possible. Reciting as much Quran as possible is a long journey. Make a task, means fix it, uh, some uh, 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 juz of Quran that okay, I'm during this journey, I'm going to be reciting 10 juz, 15 juz, these many juz I want to recite during my journey. I want to recite blessings on Durood and Salah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa We are going to Medina, so I want to recite it 100,000 times, I want to recite it 50,000 times, whatever that may be. So, this is the journey where really we need to make best use of our time as much as we can. As I said, if you are going straight to Makkah, then you need to keep your ihram with you. And everything that you need for ihram, all the necessaries, necessaries of ihram, keep them with you. Make sure the bag is not too big that they pull it away from you at the airport and then your ihram is gone. So don't make the, make the bag too big or too heavy. Otherwise, sometime 
they would take it from you at the gate. And they will say, you know, you will get it when you arrive Jeddah. Your ihram is gone and you need it before you arrive Jeddah. Now, the method of doing ihram, and don't let this method worry you, I will explain more details to it in a few minutes. But the proper method of wearing ihram, that a person takes shower, and then he wears the two sheets of ihram, sisters wear normal clothing, and after wearing these two sheets of ihram, the person performs two rak'ah salah. After these two rak'ah salah, he makes the intention of hajj or umrah or hajj and umrah, whichever he is planning to do, and I will explain that. And then he recites, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ This is the method of putting on the ihram. But now the question would be that what if we are in the plane and we cannot take a shower? We cannot perform the Turaqa Salah, but of course you will be able to do the Salah anyway. But in case, remember taking the shower is Sunnah. Performing the Turaqa Salah is Sunnah. So if you don't do it, it's fine. The thing that is must to do is to change the clothing, have two sheets on you, and perform labbaik, recite labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, make the intention and recite labbaik. These are the three things that we have to do. God forbid, God forbid, you get in a situation where even you lost your ihram. What to do now? Is still make the intention and recite labbaik. When you arrive Jeddah, get the two sheets over there and change your ihram. In simple words, not to confuse you, but so that we know the ruling, in reality, these sheets normally are known as to be ihram. In reality, this is not ihram. This is called ihram, but it's not really ihram. The real ihram is intention and labbaik. That is the real ihram. Wearing the normal clothing is not allowed during ihram for man, and therefore we have to wear the sheets. See what I'm saying? So this is called ihram, is not ihram. Ihram is intention and labbaik. Wearing the normal clothing during ihram is not allowed, therefore we say change it before the intention. But if you didn't change it before intention, it still you can make the intention of ihram, you wear the ihram. So now you are in ihram, but you are going against the rule of ihram by wearing normal clothing. So as soon as you arrive Jeddah, you buy the ihram, you find that you can buy it over there, buy it over there at the airport and change your clothing. If it was for a short period of time, which means seven hours, eight hours, all you have to do is pay some sadaqah for not wearing the sheets of ihram at the time of making the intention. And that's all you have to do. Rather than going against the second order and that is passing the border. That is the border that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, which is called miqat. Passing the border without ihram. That is a worse situation than making the intention and not wearing the sheet. So anyway, making it simple, you wear your ihram. How to wear the ihram? If it is possible to take a shower, take a shower. If it is possible, if not possible, and you can make wudu and perform two rak'ah salah, make wudu and perform two rak'ah salah. Even if that is not possible, then just wear your ihram, just make the intention and recite talbiya, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika lak labbaik, inna alhamda wa al-na'mata lak wa al-mulk, la sharika lak. One is fard and three times is sunnah, recite it three times. Very simple method of wearing ihram. That is, change your clothing, make wudu, Perform two rak'ah salah if you can. More preferably, if you can, take a shower. If not, then don't worry about it. And if you can't even do the wudu and two rak'ah salah, at least change your clothing, wear the two sheets, and make the intention in labbaik Allahumma labbaik. If you're going to Makkah first, you would have to wear the ihram before arriving Jeddah. At least an hour before arriving Jeddah. And of course, in these days, wear it much before that because there will be a lot of crowds at the bathroom before that because everyone wants to change the ihram. So, wear the ihram before arriving at that. If a person is going straight to Medina, and straight to Medina means you may be in Riyadh or in Jeddah for transit, but after that you would go to Medina. From Jeddah you are going to Medina, you are not going to Makkah, then don't wear ihram. 
You don't need to wear haram, don't wear it. You would go to Medina and when you are coming back from Medina to Makkah, at that time you, wear your, you will wear your haram. If a person goes to Medina first, you would go to Medina and stay in Medina in normal clothing. Then when you are coming back to Makkah, then you will wear a haram while you are leaving Medina that you would see it over there and everyone will instruct you over there on wearing and where to haram, wear the haram from when leaving Medina Munawwara. What the person would make the intention for when wearing the haram? We said make the intention for a haram. What that intention would be for? You would be doing either hajj or umrah or you are combining hajj and umrah. There is three types of hajj. And now, again I would say, if you're, this is the first time you're hearing it, don't confuse yourself. If you're reading book, don't confuse yourself. I will tell you all three types of hajj and then I will tell you what hajj you would be doing. Three types of hajj. One is called ifrad, the other is called tamattu, the third is called qiran. Ifrad means a person going from here and he is planning to do hajj only, no umrah. The person is not planning to do umrah. This is hajj ifrad. Hajj tamattu is you are planning to do umrah. What you are going to do is you go Makkah, do umrah, and then you have some days before hajj. You take your haram off. Then on the 8th of the hajjah, you would put on the haram again for hajj. So you went from here, you performed umrah, then you took the haram off, then you put on the haram again for hajj. This is hajj tamattu. The third is hajj qiran. Qiran, qarana yaqrinu means combining two things together, putting two things together. This is why horn of the animal is called qarn. Because normally they have two, not one. So qarn, two things. So Quran is combining it, which means a person is going from here, he would wear the ihram for hajj and umrah together. He will wear the ihram for hajj and umrah together. You would go over there to Makkah, perform umrah, don't take the ihram off. Keep the ihram in the, with the same ihram you perform the hajj. The difference between Quran and Tamattu, in Quran you performed Umrah and Hajj with the same Ihram. In Quran, in Tamattu you did Umrah first, took the Ihram off and then you wear the Ihram again for Hajj Quran. This is Quran. In, in Tamattu, you took the, you made uh, the uh, Umrah, took the Ihram off and now you put the Ihram on again for Hajj and this is called Hajj Tamattu. So, Ifrad is Hajj by itself, no Umrah. Tamattu, you would perform Umrah, but you would take the Ihram off between the Hajj and Umrah. Quran is, with the same Ihram, you would perform Hajj and Umrah. So now when you are in the plane, and you are making the intention, you will have to decide, generally no one would do Hajj Ifrad going from here. So, you would be going, you will be making the intention of Hajj Tamattu or Quran. Quran is the best type of Hajj. But it's more difficult because you will have to keep the ihram on throughout the time that you are in Makkah until you would perform hajj and finish your hajj. Generally, people who go from here, they do hajj tamattu, which means they go and perform umrah, and then they take the ihram off, and then they would go to, uh, 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 they would wear the ihram on again for hajj. So generally, people do tamattu. People who go straight to Medina, and then they go to Makkah, normally they do Quran or Tamattu, they have choice for both. Or in fact, I would say that then they will, mostly their choice would be Ifrad or Quran. Ifrad means from Medina you go to Makkah, and at the time of going to Makkah, this is what many groups do, and that is they will take you straight to Medina. How is it that you people are doing? Any idea? Tamattu. Okay. So, people who go to Medina straight, they would go to Medina straight, and then, just a day before Hajj, they will go to Makkah. So now, at that time, doing tamattu is impossible. Because there is no reason for a person to do Umrah, take the Haram off, and then do Hajj. So the choices are two, Ifrad or Quran. 
Ifrad means he would go to Makkah and then he would just wait for Hajj and he would go for Hajj. He won't do any tawaf or Umrah at that time. And Quran means you would go to Makkah, perform tawaf and sa'i for Umrah. And then you stay in the Ihram until you go for Hajj. In either case, you will have to stay in that ihram when you're leaving from Medina and you're going just a day before or, the, or, or arriving on the day of Hajj. So generally, you will keep your same ihram. Now with that ihram, the choice is, are you going to go to Mecca and do tawaf and sa'i and then go to Mina? Or you are going to go straight to Mina or even if you stay in Mecca, you are not going to do tawaf and sa'i. So if you don't do tawaf and sa'i, your Hajj will be ifrat. And if you do perform tawaf and sa'i, that hajj will become qiran. Your intention, you have to make the intention ahead of time. In hajj ifrad, you don't have to slaughter the animal. If you do ifrad, slaughtering the animal is not must. But in tamattar and qiran, you have to slaughter the animal. Why would you do ifrad instead of qiran? This will be for elderly people, women, or if you are arriving Makkah Mukarrama, just on the 7th or 8th of the Hijjah, then I would recommend don't wear the Ihram for Quran, because generally after this whole journey, then being in Medina for those days, and then going from Medina to Makkah, which takes you another about 15 hours or 20 hours, now there is a whole Hajj ahead of you, and you are extremely tired, you need rest, but you put the ihram on for Quran, so you have to go and perform tawaf and say, and it is extremely crowded. Everyone, whoever is doing Quran, they are doing tawaf and say at that time. So it is extremely crowded. Not to scare you, but this is for planning purpose. So that you, when you get over there, you know what to do. So especially for women, I would never recommend if you're going from Medina and arriving there on the 7th or 8th, and you would do Quran. Don't ever try it. For elderly people, don't try it. If you're young, you want to take that chance, inshallah, you may be able to do it. Now, the method of performing the Hajj. Or before that, let's talk about the method of performing the Umrah for those who are doing Tamattu. First thing you will be performing Umrah. So, you arrive Makkah Mukarramah. You would go to the hotel, put your baggage over there. One of the general mistake, common mistake people make, they go to the hotel and they start washing their hands with the soap. That soap in the hotel has fragrance because you paid a lot of money. So it's not a fragrance free soap that you would get over there. And right there, you went one against the rule of the haram and that is using of a fragrance is not allowed. So be careful. This is a common mistake people make over there. Now you put your stuff over there. If you are able, take a shower, get yourself ready and go to haram. When going to the haram, generally people from this part of the world, they take hotels very close to the haram. So therefore, if your hotel is very close to the haram, then keep your slippers at the hotel, into your room. Walk bare feet. Because you don't want to keep on worrying about your slippers throughout the time. When you're doing tawaf and sa'in. You will enter from one door, you'll come out totally the other side. So, if that's one less headache for you, if you keep your slippers at your home, and then just walk bare feet, or maybe, you know, some of the uh, for the uh, surgeons and those type of uh, people who have some special type of covering for the feet. If you have access to that, keep few of those. Don't steal it from the hospital, buy it. But keep some of those so you can they get to the door of the haram and throw it. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. In case, but still keep a small bag for keeping the slippers for the future times when you go to the haram. If your hotel is very close, is that close, it may be best that always keep the slippers in the, haram, in the hotel room, but you will get used to that and you would know your situation after that. First time, don't take it. Especially as I said, if you are very close to the haram. When you are entering the haram, remember the number of the door that you are entering from. Because all the doors have a number. 
And you look around, you say, okay, I remember, it's two pillars like this, and this is where I'm entering from. And you go inside, Haram of Makkah, you go in circle. You know that. And when you go in circle, during the circle now you're looking. All sides are looking same. I don't know where I came from. So, remember the number. Number two, remember the side of the door in connection with the black stone. In connection with the black stone, the black stone in this side and my door is the opposite side or the same side or on the right of it. So, in connection with the black stone, remember the entrance of the haram that you entered from, that will be the easy thing for you to remember. If you're going with other group of people, your friends, family, anything like this, stay together as much as you can, but don't pay your full attention towards just staying together. And throughout the ibadah, you're just thinking about staying together. Generally, people who have experience, you can stay together easy. But in case if anyone is lost, you should have an understanding, we are not going to wait for each other over here. We are not going to look for each other over here. A person may be only three feet away from you, and you spend hours looking for the person. Three million people. Not easy to find people. The best thing is, if we get lost, finish your tawaf, we will go back and meet at the hotel room. We will meet over there in our room, or in the lobby, whatever that is. But after, I mean, if, we, if we don't find someone, or if someone is lost, we are not going to stop, we are not going to start looking, don't even bother looking, finish your ibadah and come back and we will meet over there. I will come back after Isha, I will come back after Fajr, I will come back after Zohar, and then we will meet over there. Now, you have your ihram on, you went into the haram, remember to say the dua of entering the haram, and the dua of seeing the Kaaba, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the dua at the time of seeing the Kaaba, the dua is accepted. That is the prime time of the acceptance of dua. So make as much dua as you can, as soon as you see the Kaaba, but when you see, don't stand right in the door, in the middle, move away so that you are not on people's way and you don't keep on pushing people or you are not hurting people by standing on their way. So move away and make dua. Now you would be approaching the Kaaba. Instead walking towards the Kaaba, as you approach the Kaaba, you are heading towards the black stone. This is where your tawaf will start from. You don't perform two raka'ah, tahiyyatul masjid over there because your tawaf is the replacement of tahiyyatul masjid. So you go over there by the, uh, towards the black stone. Before you get to the black stone, now for men, you want to do something that is called ittiba' in sharia. Ittiba' means take the sheet from under the right arm. Take the sheet from under the right arm and put it on the left shoulder. This is called ittiba'. This ittiba' will continue for the whole tawaf. From the beginning till the end of the tawaf, you would be doing ittiba'. And the second thing during the tawaf you would do is called ramil. This is for men only. And ramil means walking like soldiers, moving the arms and walking like that. It's not really running. People think that uh, ramil means you run. It's not running. It's just walking like soldiers would walk by moving the arms. This is ramil. So you do ittiba for the whole tawaf for men and ramil in the just first three rounds of the tawaf. Of every tawaf after which there is a sign. Not norm every tawaf. Every tawaf after which there is a sign. You would do ittiba and ramal. Now, you got your, you got to the black stone. You already fix your sheet to have the ittiba. Make the intention before you face the line of the black stone. Some of the books will say that go to the black line at the black stone. Remember, that black line is not there anymore. There used to be a strip there that will tell you that you are straight with the line of the black stone. They removed it. So it's not there anymore. So now you will have to just aim it towards the black stone by yourself, on your own. So you go over there before you face the black stone, make the intention, Ya Allah, I'm making the intention of performing this tawaf for the umrah that I'm performing. You made the intention, and now you move so that you are facing the black stone. Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. And you kiss your hand, 
and you start walking. Your left side will be towards the Kaaba. You want to go seven rounds. As you start walking, you keep on walking, you do the rummel. Now, for the three rounds, you will be doing rummel. At the third round and the end of the third round, you will stop the rummel. As you're walking, don't look here and there. People are excited. They want to see the Kaaba. They want to see people. They want to see the Haram. They want to see the lights, cameras, everyone, everything. People come back and they even have counted how many lights were there. But just like in Salah, we are supposed to keep our gaze down in front of us. Same way in Tawaf, the ruling is keep your gaze down right in front of you. Don't even look at the Kaaba. That is not the time. Just keep on keeping your gaze straight down and keep on walking in that direction. During this tawaf, you would be the best thing, the best ibadah is to recite tasbihat. Praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking Allah's forgiveness. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah al-azim, astaghfirullah. These type of tasbihat, these are the best ibadah of tawaf during tawaf. Until when you get to the corner before the black stone. That is known as ar ruqn al-Yamani because it's facing, it's towards Yemen. When you get over there between Ruqn al-Yamani and the black stone, you would recite, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. In some of the narrations, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also heard reciting in that portion, Rabbi qanna'ni bima razaqtani wa barikli fihi. وَخْلُفْ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ غَائِبَةٍ لِبِخَيْرٍ So, this is also Mustahab Basnoon to recite during that era, in, in, in that section. And as I said, most of the hadiths talk about رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخَرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Other than that, the books that give you the du'as for tawaf. Of course, those du'as means they just collected du'as. They are not really the du'a of tawaf because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never recited du'as loudly through, during the tawaf. All he was uh, heard was doing tasbihat, so that is the best ibadah. Sometimes people try to hold to the book and then they just read from the book and they don't even understand. Better than that is you make dua for yourself. I generally advise people that think of seven most important things you want to make dua for. Make a target that these are the seven things I want to make dua for. And then on each, in each round of the tawaf, make dua for one of these things. So, that will be one of the good things. Otherwise, you can just keep on mixing the du'as. We normally make du'a. Just keep on making du'a throughout the rounds until you get to the uh, Ruqn al-Yamani and then you recite, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنِيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخَرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ After three rounds, men stop doing rummel. Stop moving that hand and now walk normally. Women were walking normally even from the beginning, which means there is no change, no difference. At each time that you finish one round, you would face the Kaaba. Generally, you won't face it now. You don't turn your chest towards the Kaaba. It's against the rule. So, you will keep it straight. But when you come to the black stone again, you would face the black stone and again, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, and you kiss your hand. Of course, the books will say that you go and kiss the black stone. But generally, it's too difficult to do it, especially in those days. So, Practically, this is what you would be doing, that you would face it, you would uh, and say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, kiss your hand, and now continue to the second round. So, this is how you would be performing seven rounds of tawaf. After finishing the tawaf, you need to perform two raka'a salah. Again, books will say, and this is in the hadith, that perform two raka'a salah at maqam Ibrahim. Which means... You will see a place over there that is known as Maqam Ibrahim that has the footprints of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So praying two raka'ah behind it is sunnah, but you won't be able to do it, especially in the days of Hajj. And people sometimes they think, no, it's musk that I have to do it there. And then they come in a group of people, four or five people are fighting everyone to hold people from coming in front of this person and there are two or three people performing the rakat over there, two rakat over there, disturbing everyone's tawaf and ruining their own salatu. Wherever you can find a place, go towards the back 
and perform two rak'ah salah. As I said, it's sunnah to do it in Muqam Ibrahim, but you won't practically, with the crowd of those days, you won't be able to do it. So go anywhere in the back of the haram where there is room to perform salah and perform two rak'ah salah over there. These are the two rak'ah salah of tawaf. In the first rak'ah you recite قُلْ يَا يُهُ الْكَافِرُونَ In the second rak'ah you recite قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ This is mustahab. And make dua after the two rak'ah salah. After that, if you, uh, it's available to you, drink the water of Zamzam. Now go towards Safa and Marwa. You will be going towards Safa. Safa and Marwa, initially there were two mountains over there where you would be doing the tawaf between them. But nowadays you really don't see the real mountain, you just see a little hill on both sides. So you go on top of the Safa, and as you are climbing the mountain of Safa, you recite, إِنَّ الصَّفَا وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ وَاعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوُّفَ بِهِمَا This ayah. And now you would be facing towards the Kaaba. You stand, you go up, and you don't have to climb it all the way, halfway, and turn towards the Kaaba. Your chest is towards the Kaaba and make dua. This is the time of the acceptance of dua once again. So you make dua over there. As you normally raise your hand in dua, this is how you would raise your hands and make dua. And when you finish, you just finish your dua and start walking towards Marwa. From here, as you are heading towards Marwa, you would see two green lines up. <coughs> there are lights also. They are called Milain Akhdarain. Two green lines. It's sunnah for men to run in between these two lines. This is where Hajr anha was running between the lines. So, it's sunnah for men to run between the two lines if possible. So, you would run. Now, this is not walking like a soldier, like in Tawaf. This is running. So, you run over there till the next line. It's not sunnah to run for a woman. It's only for men. You continue, same thing, the best ibadah of say is dua and tasbihat. And if a person is done with dua and tasbihat, then you can recite Quran or do anything else. So the best ibadah is dua and tasbihat. You go to Marwa. Again, you get onto the hill of Marwa and face towards the Kaaba again. Make dua as you normally would make the dua. When you finish the dua, now you have finished one round and you are ready to start the second round and heading towards Safa again. You would be making seven rounds in this way, which means you started at Safa and end at Marwa. So your Sa'i will start at Safa, it will end at Marwa. Over there at Marwa, if you are doing Hajj Tamattu, which means now this is only Umrah, your intention for this Ihram was Umrah only, so now it's time for you to take the Ihram off. So you would go and get your, cut your hair or shave your head, and now your ihram is over. Go and change your clothing and your ihram is done. As far as the ihram for hajj, and before I go that one more thing that I remembered, we said about tamattu and qiran. And now you need to pay a little attention so that you understand the point. We said about tamattu and qiran, in tamattu you don't take the ihram, or you take the ihram off in tamattu and then you wear it again for hajj. In Qiran, you don't take the ihram off after Umrah. You keep the same ihram until Hajj. Remember, this doesn't mean you cannot change these sheets of ihram. Same ihram means same intention. As I said earlier, ihram is really intention. So you are in the same intention, same rules of ihram. You can change these sheets as many times as you want. Although it's not good to just keep on changing them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, the best Hajj, أفضل الحج العج والثج العج means the person keeps on reciting لبيك loudly and thج means shedding a lot of blood of animals doing a lot of sacrifices and in other hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best haji the best person performing hajj is الشعث الغبر that a person whose hair are dirty his clothes are dirty which means his worry over there is not how I look and how my clothing are and my hair and is standing in front of the mirror, mirror and taking a shower. No, just don't worry about dirt, don't worry about anything. Let it, don't dirty it intentionally, but whatever happens, don't worry about it. 
and keep on concentrating on your ibadah. Don't try to stay clean and changing and taking shower and all of that. <laughs>